Good evening, everybody. It's Sunday, December 2nd, almost Christmas time. Hard to believe. Welcome to Open Mic VO. I'm Graham Spicer, and so glad you're here with us tonight. Tonight, we're going to be speaking about planning for 2019. What is it that you're going to do in order to move your voiceover career forward in the new year? And uh, definitely want to hear whatever ideas that you might have. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things to go over first. Um, number one is please keep yourself muted at your end if you're not actively participating in the conversation. I don't want to dissuade you from unmuting yourself and asking questions or contributing for sure. But if you're not actively involved, just hit the mute button so we don't have problems with echo and feedback and background noise. Second thing I want to mention is that we're all pros here. Some of us may be. Uh, longer serving pros than others, but we're all professionals nonetheless and want to make sure that everyone gets treated with the level of respect that they deserve. And for those of you who are new to Open Mic VO or new to the voiceover business, there's no such thing as a silly question. Please go ahead and ask away. The third thing I want to mention is that we record Open Mic VO and it gets posted to YouTube. So just keep that in mind if you share any information with us tonight that could be considered confidential or proprietary. And the fourth thing is that uh, Open Mic VO is brought to you by World Voices, uh, world-voices.org, the Professional Association for Voice Actors. Uh, just want to make clear though that um, anything that I might say or that any of tonight's participants might say aren't necessarily the policy of World Voices or approved by World Voices. Hey, we're just out here throwing stuff around and, uh, and uh, don't want you to mistake anything that I might say specifically as coming from World Voices. So with that said, again, we're talking tonight about planning for 2019. Uh, what is it you're going to be doing to move your voiceover career forward? And I think we're gonna keep it pretty loose tonight. So you know, questions on any topic relating to voiceover are welcome, but let's try and work with this theme of 2019 planning. Um, also wanna mention, by the way, you can uh, post anything that you would like in the chat box. Uh, usually we have a fairly active chat box uh, in these open mic VO sessions. And any questions you might want to ask, and perhaps you aren't, uh, you're calling in from a telephone or your studio is not set up uh, at this moment. Um, if you are shy and don't want to ask your question live, just type it into the Q&A box and we'll make sure that we address it there. So I'm gonna start unmuting people. Just give me a moment to do this. Takes a second. Just unmuting a few more people here. Once you see you're unmuted, if you'd like to be the first to get us started tonight with a comment or a question with regards to how to improve your voiceover career in 2019, that'd be awesome. I can tell you one of the first things I'm going to be doing is I'm really going to be digging deep into customer relationship management. I have been preaching about using CRM systems for years um, to voiceover students and have been negligent in really fully using one on, uh, on my own behalf. So I'm going to be uh, doing some careful, uh, some careful consideration of um, voiceoverview.com, which is uh, run by a couple of voice actors and is uh, a very well-regarded CRM system specifically made for voice actors. Um, there's also a free one. Well, it's not free, but it's included in your membership package at Gravy for the Brain, gravyforthebrain.com, which is a great uh, website resource for voice actors. Um, Bodalgo, Armin at bodalgo.com has recently um, beta testing his own CRM system as well. 
So there are a few of them out there for sure. Karen is adding, there's also a CRM called Upper Level, which I'm not familiar with. Um, Karen, is that one that's specific to the voiceover business or? That's actually one that Brad Newman developed and is, um, is rolling out. Ah, uh, fantastic. Right is, it, so, is it ready for prime time yet? Is it already launched and ready to go? If it hasn't, then it's really, really close, but it's, it's right on that cusp there. So uh, I think it's upperlevelcrm.com or upperlevel.com. Something like Fantastic. that. Fantastic. Check it out. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, he's got his ducks in a row, I think. Karen, do you use a CRM on regularly in your business? I actually have two that I use. Um, I use Nimble. Right. Um, and I also use one that's an in Gmail CRM called Streak. And that's actually the one I use most frequently because it works right within your Gmail. Um, and if you have G Suite, like I have, it works within that too, um, keeping track of companies. Um, they're different in that the streak is better at keeping track of companies, whereas Nimble is better at keeping track of individual people. So, so streak doesn't necessarily know that Joe Smith is associated with Acme Studios. You can put him under Acme Studios, but say if Joe Smith moves from Acme to you know, Joe Blow Studios, then you have to move him there. Whereas right. in Google, it's person by person rather than business by business. I, I made an effort to get into Nimble about 18 months ago. I think it was uh, Mark Scott that was recommending Nimble as a, a potential mm -hmm. CRM. I just found it, the, the learning curve was really pretty steep. It is really steep, which is why I'm, I'm using Streak more, <laughs> ah. actually. Because I find it a little more um, intuitive, and it also, like I said, it's it's within uh, Gmail, but you can try it for free. I mean, I'm still on the free version, and I've been using it for years. So streak, streak. Yep, okay. it's fantastic. Nifty. Anybody else have any New Year's resolutions? Anything that they are going to be tackling to progress their voiceover career in 2019? And also want, just want to mention that we're going to keep, the, keep it fairly relaxed tonight. So any questions with regards to voiceover, any comments with regards to voiceover are more than welcome. Yeah, I actually have a question. And this is for the for the panel, for all the people listening, not just specifically uh, you, Graham. Thank what you. What are people doing as far as client relations for the holidays? Like, are you sending cards? Are you sending gifts? Are you calling them personally? I mean, what are people doing? I don't do anything. <laughs> I kind of feel that, um, uh, that this is just my take on it. I, I think these people get in, inundated with so much stuff during the holidays that most likely anything you're going to do might get buried a little bit. So my tactic is to do something sort of away from the holidays, um, send a card. Um, uh, but but I, I kind of stay away from the holidays um, just because of that reason. I sort of got in the habit of sending out um, New Year's cards so that they arrive. I usually mail them like the week between Christmas and New Year's so that they arrive the week after New Year's. Yeah. That's, and, that's and, and, that, and that kind of solves two problems. It solves the issue with, do I say happy holidays or happy? Yeah. You know, See, that's Kwanzaa. always a tough one. That's really a tough yeah. one. So it eliminates that problem. And it uh, and Lynn, it, it deals with the very issue you just mentioned is that I think that 
holiday greetings really can get lost in the shuffle in that, you know, last couple of weeks before Christmas versus a card arriving the first week of January saying Happy New Year, I think um, possibly attracts a little more attention. Right. Or around, I've always liked Valentine's Day. Clever. Clever. Yeah. You can have you can have some fun with that for sure. Uh-huh. Yes. <laughs> I see James is on tonight. And James, I, I know that you uh, work fairly regularly with a bunch of audiobook um, rights holders. Do you um, do you acknowledge them in some way over the holidays? I just sort of keep in contact with them, you know, when I have something to report, really. Uh, the, the, the authors that I'm working with that there are like return customers, um, some are kind of laid back. Um, some, uh, they don't bother me per se, but, you know, some um, like to keep in touch and want to know how things are going. But there's no pressure involved. One of uh, my, I guess, uh, New Year's resolutions or something is to try to sift through and choose um, um, projects that are going to make me more money. <laughs> Because I have I have a lot of authors that like me to continue on with their series, but I've I've had to turn one down already because I looked at my sales numbers and people are not buying the audiobook. And there are three more in the series. And if they're not gonna buy the first one, they're not gonna buy the second one, and they're not gonna buy the third one. So I have to sort of shy away from that because it's basically running into this is a waste of my time territory. And trying to turn somebody down is a hard thing to do. So you're going to be choosier in the projects that you take on. Yeah, and I also have a few in the pipeline that are uh, doing very well that uh, I have two more to complete for one author, uh, two or three more possibly for another author. So these are doing fairly well. And I want to concentrate on getting those out so I can start auditioning for more things because this is bogging me down. What I did was my eyes got bigger than my stomach and I started auditioning for a whole bunch of stuff that I thought was interesting. And my track record when I first started out was maybe I'd get one in 10 and then it wound up one in three. And now it's turning out to be almost everyone I auditioned for. So <laughs> I, I'm doing it to myself and I have to stop that. Just out of curiosity, how, how do you determine what makes a successful audiobook? Like a, a thousand downloads, a couple thousand downloads? What, what uh, makes I, my friend, I don't know if Tom is on, but Tom Jordan, my friend out in California, has this formula worked out for himself. If he's doing a royalty share, say, uh, and the book is going to cost so much on Audible, uh, say it's a 10-hour book that's going to cost $30 or $25 or something like that. So when, if he's doing it for a royalty share, he's going to, he, to, to recoup what he would make for a per finished hour rate, he has determined that f from each book that he sells, say that he makes $2.50. Uh, to, to make enough money for a comparable, comparable per finished hour rate, he would have to sell two to 300 uh, audiobooks in a certain amount of time, a certain period of time, like a, a month or two months or something like that. So he's worked out this formula, which, you know, I have to uh, talk to him more about. Uh, so he's trying to shift over to a, a, a um, per finished hour rate or even kind of a hybrid deal with people um, where he works out that he can make something on the front end and still be able to recoup on the back end if it's a, if it's a royalty share project. Mm -hmm. Uh, and choosing those wisely, you know, is there, there are things that you can look for, but sometimes it's just a crapshoot. Um, I've been doing sort of well with that, not as well as I would like, which is, you know, one of the things that I would like to get accomplished in the new year. When, um, when you come up with a hybrid deal is, are you able to, account for that somehow within the ACX system or this is something there, that they used to ACX used to have something called a uh, stipend program, which they don't offer anymore, but that was sort of random because it was either audible or ACX chose those when they came in. 
and it was kind of a lottery kind of thing. It was a catch as catch can kind of thing. And they, they still have it listed on their website, but it's, it doesn't exist anymore. But what some people do is work out hybrid deals in that if, if uh, the author or the rights holder is insisting on a, a royalty share as opposed to a per finished hour rate. Uh, what people generally do uh, is farm out their proofing and editing and uh, mastering. I do my own, which I've been chastised for, but I like to do it. So I do my own. But uh, th those things, when you farm them out, cost money. You know, uh, a good editor or proofer is going to get up to $75 to $100 per finished hour just, you know, to go through it and make sure you have all the, the words right and and, um, you know, give you a list of corrections and, and then, you know, go back over it again and make sure everything is done. Uh, so what some people try to do is recoup that cost up front because they know this is going to be, uh, say, a 10-hour book. Uh, they're going to be spending anywhere from, you know, 75 to to $100 per finished hour uh, for that service. So they try to get that ahead of time rolled into the um, to the uh, the royalty share so at least their production costs are covered how does uh, you're a, a union actor if i remember right james yeah. how does um sag aftra uh deal with these royalty share type situations they can't they be don't. very happy with them they don't. And, and uh, audiobooks is a very gray area as far as the union goes. Um, ACX does offer um, opportunity to create a union job, say that uh, the union scale for um, audiobooks for a per finished hour is anywhere from, I mean, they, they make different deals with different publishing houses, but the average is about $235 per finished hour. That's just for talent, though. That's just for saying the words and recording it. That doesn't include uh, the editing, doesn't include the proofing, doesn't include, you know, um, uh, picking up the mistakes. It doesn't include mastering. It's just, you know, you, you do the finished hour, and when the book is done, you get paid that, that rate. Um, and ACX makes um, allowances that if you go through a paymaster or something like that, you can contribute to the pension, health, and welfare and, and make this union job if you're getting uh, the union rate or above as talent. Um, does that happen very frequently? Yeah, it does. Yep. It, it, it does to certain people. Uh, the person that would know the most about that would be Jeffrey Kafer. Uh, because he's on top of all that, I think he's also on a couple of committees with the union too. So he he's is, the yeah. person. He's the person who, who knows the ins and outs of that kind of thing. Um, I have had very lucrative per finished hour rates. I have had very bad royalty shares. <laughs> it's 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 a crapshoot. It really is. Which all goes to why you plan on being pickier on the jobs you take on exactly. in 2019. Exactly. I mean, I have one book that I thought, you know, I, I auditioned for it and I was glad that I got it. And then after I got into it and I did it, it was like, uh, I don't know about this one, but I spent the time and I did it. It has not sold a single copy. Oh, you're kidding. No. And that's, you know, a month of my life that I will never get back. Yeah, that is, that's got to be pretty uh, demoralizing when it doesn't sell a single copy. Yep. <laughs> it is. <laughs> the only person that feels worse about it is the author. I don't know. You know, the weird thing is, I mean, if people are buying the written book uh, as a narrator, I mean, if you're doing a real to share uh, uh, project and this is what happens through Audible ACX, uh, Audible gets 60% off the top. That's their profit margin. And that the rest of the 40% is split between you and the author. So you're getting 20% of whatever the sale price is of the book. That's your royalty. So you have to sell a ton of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, especially since Audible's frequently blowing these things out at like $6 and $7 a book. Yeah, well, th that's the other thing too is um, the longer books are going to be more lucrative because um, they cost more. Um, when we finish a book, the, the rights holder and the narrator, uh, can request 25 free codes, right. Uh, from audible. Um, 
And a lot of that is for promotion. Uh, they do count towards sales. So that's one of the ways to try to get sales. And what people will offer is a code, you know, uh, listen to my book and review it. But when they use the code, it, uh, according to uh, Audible, it still counts as a sale. So, um, cool. so that happens. But uh, I don't know that I have 25 friends in the world that would want to listen to me yammer on about something. So, uh, you know, I've got a, a boatload of codes just sitting in my computer waiting. And the weird thing is, is that the codes are good for anything. Uh, it not necessarily, they're not tied to your book. So if you offer somebody a code and they use it for somebody else's book, you're SOL. Yeah. Oh, James, I'd listen to you yammer, honey. Yammer? <laughs> Lay on, I'm with you. I'd listen to James yammer all night long. <laughs> Um, Graham, I, I would just say as far as, as far as the new year coming up, um, I, I'm really going to start focusing, um, on getting local business. I mean, that isn't something I've really done. Um, so I'm, I'm up here in Northern California and I really haven't, I really haven't just looked outside my back door and I know there's a lot of business out there and I've been kind of lazy and this year I want to really focus on that. So that's so what, kind of what my... kind of local business are you talking about? Like where, where are you going to, you know, cast your net? Well, I'm advertising agencies, um, lots of advertising agencies. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm also going to take a look at, um, there's, there's a guy up here who has a pool of VO people that he contracts out and does a lot of um, um, station imaging um, so I, you know, I'm going to start kind of looking around, uh, real estate agents. I, I know that sounds kind of wackadoodle, but they, they actually, there's a lot of really upscale homes where I'm at up here. Um, I'm in the area where there's Pebble Beach and all that. And, uh, very often they have homes where they'll make complete video. They have video production companies right. up here mm -hmm. and they often need, uh, VO uh, for descriptive purposes of the, the homes. And so I thought, you know, there's a lot of that up here. So, I mean, that's something I haven't even looked into. I mean, it's something I haven't even touched yet. So, um, so this year I'm going to start doing a little, you know, being a little bit more um, and, you know, just, just being a little more adventurous and going out there and seeing what's out there. When you say you're in Northern Cal, this is like, San Francisco or you're well north of that? Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm just a little south of San Francisco in the Monterey Bay area. Okay. Yeah. So there's yeah. certainly lots going on in that area. Then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Lynn. Sure. Who else is uh, making resolutions for 2019? Who's got some ideas on what they're going to do to move their business forward in the new year. We've talked about uh, customer relationship management systems a little bit, uh, talked about uh, being choosier in the projects that we take on. Uh, Lynn just mentioned she's going to make an effort to get more local business. Who else has got some ideas on what they're going to do in 2019 to move their business forward? Hi, Graham. Hey, Dave, how are you tonight? Good, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Good. I moved to Bangkok about a month ago for other business, and I'm going to continue the VO on the side. There's a few organizations here to do VO stuff, and, and that is uh, something that I'll be pursuing in the months ahead. I got an audition with one company, and, and there's only about four in Bangkok that, that do VO. Commercial stuff, as you might imagine, is a bit thin, but uh, I'm just exploring that. I'll be back and forth every few months to the States, but uh, be residing here most of the time. So that's my challenge is a foreign country with uh, only English as my VO language and uh, pursuing that. Well, first of all, congratulations on what sounds like quite an adventure. And uh, I hope that it works out well for you. Is this going to be a permanent thing or maybe two or three years? What, what's the plan? I'm co-owner of an indoor uh, farming company and we're ramping up to do some uh, pretty significant business in all of Southeast Asia and the Middle East. So I'll, I'll be maintaining so you, a presence for quite a while. Yeah, you might be a while then. Well, that's fantastic. Well, best of luck with the uh, venture. And 
best of luck with the the voiceover that you you know i'm sure there's going to be need for american accented english in it's there's there's one company and people can check it out it's called andovar and they have offices in i believe london and bangkok and maybe paris but they do international translation so if anybody has uh, a foreign language that they're fluent in and are comfortable doing voiceover in that would be a company to to contact as a, far as i know though they require you to go into their studios they don't really deal with people in home studios you have to be willing to go in and and sit down in their studios but it's a pretty cush gig it's actually pretty good money for a place like thailand and uh, and we're talking yeah, look, it, 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 uh, uh, an upper end voices dot com gig is not the same, but these are anywhere from fifty to eighty dollars an hour, and that's a lot of money in Bangkok, and yeah. it's pretty regular work. You can generally get uh, three, four hours of work a week, and that's a pretty ch- good chunk of change in Bangkok. Yeah, I, certainly your uh, dollar goes a lot further in Thailand than it does uh, in San Francisco. Well, if you walk in there, uh, of course, it's Thailand, so there's all the shoes outside the door. But you walk in, and it's very it's a quiet neighborhood, and you walk in, and it is bustling. There'll be 20 or 25 VO people plus editors. Uh, there's all sorts of Q&A, Q, Q quality control going on. It's a really bustling place. It took me by surprise, the scope of the operation. They do a lot of business in international uh, voiceover. Fantastic. Well, good luck. Thanks. And uh, what, what time is it in Bangkok right now? It's 9.23 in the morning on Monday. We're from the future. So you're uh, exactly 12 hours ahead of Eastern time. Correct. Yeah, it works out nicely for business. We, we have to interact with people all over, but it works out nicely. I, I'm still going to try to audition for some stuff in the States. I haven't worked out the logistics of that yet, but... Um, that's that's the direction I'm going with voice over here. It's it's quite a bit different, but there are opportunities. Fantastic. Well, again, congratulations and and good luck as you settle in in Thailand. Thank you. And hey, Dave. Hey, Dave. If you if if the indoor growing thing doesn't work out for you in Bangkok, come back to Monterey Bay. We're doing lots of indoor growing in Monterey Bay. <laughs> Well, we're actually about to sign a contract for about, uh, it's a very large uh, nine-figure number uh, for uh, some indoor growing in the Middle East. And then we have, we have all sorts of stuff going on throughout Southeast Asia. <laughs> well, good luck. Yeah, there's, uh, now that Canada has legalized marijuana, there's lots of indoor growing going on here, too. So. Yeah. <laughs> They're using our technology. We're involved in that, too. Oh, fantastic. Um. Moving your business forward in 2019, who's got some thoughts on what they're going to do to, uh, you know, what they're planning now in order to move their business forward in the new year? Also, any questions with regards to voiceover are welcome. It's uh, pretty relaxed here tonight. There's a, a, a reasonably smallish crowd, so want to make sure that we uh, open it up to, to any topic that is relevant to voiceover. Actually, there's something I wouldn't mind bringing up. Um, There has been in this past week a fairly um, infamous casting that has been going around um, through many of the non-union agencies. And it's for a major soft drink company. And it was something like um, two, 260s, 230s, cut downs to 15s and 6s, um, all media in perpetuity. No, it wasn't in perpetuity. It was in like all media for one year, I think it was. But these are like national TV spots. And the the price on them was $5,000. And I'm just curious, um, you know, the, these are commercials that should be many multiples of five thousand dollars each let alone five thousand dollars for everything including all of those uh edits and and cut downs does anybody have any thoughts on i I mean this is clearly uh, you know another clear case of you know erosion of rates in the industry 
and it's really upset um, a lot of you know the better known the better known or longer serving actors and uh, curious what you guys think about this Well, I I just like to say that <laughs> that whoever books it, <laughs> they're probably gonna probably uh, keep a low profile. I would imagine. Um, I you know I just thought, boy, whoever books that, that's probably not something they're gonna get on Facebook and brag about. Well, yeah, I certainly don't think that uh, I'd be very proud to uh, to talk about it. That's for sure. Um, one of our participants tonight, I'll I'll not say their name said that they got this particular um this particular project from two different sources and they deleted both of them just as being totally inappropriate i got it from four sources wow <laughs> which means which means they are just casting the net so wide um you know um I, I, it's it's pretty it's pretty impressive the effort they're making that's for sure which means to me that they're they know they're that people are upset and they're you know they're having to cast it wide because people are not auditioning for it you that know would be my guess you know what's frustrating though lynn is that they're going to find somewhere a reasonably good voice actor who's going to be willing to do it for five grand sure sure yeah yeah but they're not going to be able to brag about it. <laughs> yeah, they're, certainly it's not an ad I would put on my, uh, yes. I would put on my demo. Yep. Who else has got something for us tonight? tonight uh, something that they are looking at doing in 2019. Um, they're looking at doing in 2019 to, uh, to ramp up their business. Also, just a reminder that any questions or any sort of discussion with regards to voiceover is welcome. Again, there's a fairly modest number of us tonight. There's just under 20 of us. So uh, any questions, welcome. Uh, G um, Inverso mentioned that uh, G was posted to Voice123, even that project. Crazy. I didn't realize it had gone to uh, the online casting sites. Bit of an interesting debate that's um, going on in the chat box where Dave is saying, hey, a gig is a gig. Um, why, why is it so shameful to, to take this particular spot? And it's, um, you know, Dave, that is a legitimate and um, a, a, le a legitimate point of view. And there are, you know, lots of newer voice actors out there who would um who would support your point of view um but certainly if you look at the sag after rates for spots like what they're talking about here i think what you have to do is is consider the value of what it is that you're contributing to the creative product of this Yeah, my, my argument would be exactly that, is that you are not serving the community at large if you're, if you're undermining and, and taking jobs like that. Like if, if, there, if these are two national Diet Coke spots, they, they're going to spend literally a million dollars or more on production. Like some editor is going to get paid, you know, a, a director of photography, an editor, a, you know, the, the on-camera talent are going to get paid many, many multiples of what 
us as the voice actor would get paid on that project. And I don't see where that's equitable, really. Um, well, let me let me uh, let me mention a, something from my past. Thirty five years ago, I was one of the voices of Miller, but I didn't start out at the top of that. I started out they, the the initial gigs that I got through the producer were fifty dollars. Okay, it's nineteen eighty three money, but still, it wasn't that much money. It led to much much more opportunity after that. So maybe that's the reason they're fishing. Um, I suspect that opportunity is going to grow if they take you for a national spot. You'll have a higher profile for the national producers and the talent scouts, and you'll raise your profile considerably. I agree that it's a criminally low rate, but I just, uh, I just don't agree that it's my job to protect the rates for everybody. If you're trying to put food on the table and you can book that gig, uh, how is it my responsibility to protect the rates for everybody? I think that the the argument of I need to put food on the table is totally, a totally acceptable argument. And I think that, you know, I, I kind of sit in the middle on this particular debate because there are the union hardliners who would say that we should accept nothing less than, you know, $30,000 a spot plus, you know, getting paid for all the cut downs and, you know, that particular project, it's two sixties, cut down to thirties, cut down to fifteens, cut down to sixes. So that's really eight ads as far as the union's concerned. You know, uh, that's probably a hundred and fifty thousand dollar or two hundred thousand dollar project. Um, and then there, are, at, at the other end of the scale, there's this casting company that's trying to find someone to do it for five grand for everything all in, and. I think the days of um, the the days of the old union, the old union scale of you know making that project worth one hundred and fifty thousand or two hundred thousand dollars. That is that makes no more sense to me than the person who's trying to rationalize paying five thousand dollars for it. Um, I, I just don't think that there's that much value coming from the voiceover to warrant, you know, that much money into, uh, into the voiceover budget. I'm sure that I'm going to get slapped down now by some of the union people here, but. Consider yourself slapped. <laughs> Thank you, James. <laughs> because I, I've, I've been in one union or another all of my working life and i am a dedicated union guy now you know i'm doing audiobooks which is union and non-union so um but you know, i i won't cross that line i won't even go ficor because i'm a union guy have you been successful james in converting non-union work to union you do that much uh not much no but uh what i have been able to do yeah it it, it works out fine Mm -hmm. Karen's making the point here that, hey, it costs money to get training and to get your equipment and to set up you with your company with your accountant. And I mean, there's all kinds of costs associated with being a professional voice actor beyond just, hey, it's only going to take me, you know, an hour in a studio to bang off these ads and, you know, I'm going to get paid five grand. It's not just the hour in the studio. It's the, you know, dozens of hours of coaching that you've bought and the hundreds of hours of rehearsal and, and practice and auditioning that you've done in order to get these projects. So, um, yeah, Karen makes the, the point I'm trying to make. Just She says it more eloquently than I do. Hey, it didn't take an hour in order to do those Diet Coke spots. It took an hour in the studio and 20 years of training to do those Diet Coke spots. And uh, I think there's a guarantee when I do all that training and get the equipment, I, there's no guarantee. And just because you pay $10,000 for a nice studio and a bunch of training, there's no guarantee that you're going to get a gig or should be paid a certain amount of money for a gig. I understand the union perspective, but yeah. uh, it, not everybody's union and nobody wants, not everybody wants to be at a union. And if the gig is the gig, I, I still, I'll stand by what I said and then I'll shut up. It's not my responsibility to protect the rates for everybody. It's my responsibility to run my business and hopefully be in the black every month. 
Do you think though, Dave, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to flog this, Dave, and I, I really don't, but I, I find your perspective valuable and that's why I kind of, you know, keep, keep uh, prodding you on it. Um, can we agree though, that there's some sort of meeting in the middle that needs to happen in order for all of us to be able to continue making money at this, at, at this profession? Absolutely. You know, Maybe Absolutely. the hundred, maybe the hundred and fifty thousand dollars isn't reasonable any any longer. But maybe the five thousand dollars at some point you got to walk away saying that's just not reasonable. Well, I, I agree that 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 for that work at at that level and all the cut downs and everything, that's an outrageous number. I I'm not going to disagree yeah. there. Yeah. Um, but to bring it back to the topic, my 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 focus uh, in 2019, and I've been doing this a long time, is to continue training. I'm going to pay some money, some good money for uh, more training this year to really focus on that and keep my chops up as best I can uh, to keep to stay competitive. That's what I'm going to focus on in 2019. Uh, uh, the rates are the rates. I don't, I don't think collectively, if we all go on strike, that the rates are suddenly going to quadruple and go back to where they were 30 years ago. No, I would agree. I would agree. Thanks, Graham. Just out of curiosity, uh, Dave, you'd mentioned you're going to get some some training in 2019. Have you already figured out who you're going to be training with? And if you have, are you willing to share it with us? Um, I've mentioned it in previous ones. I think I'd be uncomfortable mentioning it now. There's so many good people out there. Yeah. Um, I, I have been preoccupied with some other stuff uh, in the last year or so. And uh, I've, I've auditioned several and talked to them on the phone. Uh, I don't think all coaches are the same, so I encourage people to go and, and audition them and see if you get along. It's mu as much a personal relationship as anything. Do you work together well? Uh, do you kind of have the same vibe? Do you share the same goals? Can they help you reach those goals? Uh, and and it, it, I think it's just, uh, even if I've done this so long, it's still important to maintain your chops and to get that training. Uh, Tiger Woods goes to a trainer all the time. Now he has one that's very expensive and, and dedicated to him, but he still gets training all the time to keep him yeah. on track. It's something I've kind of lost sight of in recent years, but I'm getting back into it. So I encourage everybody to do that. Just find one that you vibe with that's in your budget and keep your chops up. You, you know, I know many of the high end voice actors, the um, uh, Bob Bergens of the world, for example, they still go and get coaching on a fairly regular basis, just to make sure that they're staying relevant and, and staying up on the, uh, the trends and voiceover, making sure they're staying sharp and on top of their game. So it's, uh, you know, as in all things, voiceover education is uh, never ending. It, it's con you know, we, we are all constantly learning more. Tonight we're talking, Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Go ahead, Lynn. Um, I, I just kind of wanted to throw my two cents in, Worth, um, about the whole, the pay rate. And this is just kind of a general observation. I think that what it comes down to is supply and demand. And years ago, when uh, people didn't have home studios, you had to like be in LA or New York or whatever. You had to go in and audition. You had to physically be there. That reduced the pool of people who were eligible to do these kinds of commercials. And and I would imagine. So I think the pay rate was really high, and and most of them were union, and and that was really wonderful for them. Um, but obviously now with technology being what it is, people having home studios, having some very nice home studios with some wonderful equipment and, and who have really worked hard and trained hard, um, they're now in the mix. And I think that, um, that I would like to see the union um, just, I think, they're, I think they're kind of functioning on the old, paradigm. And um, I think that there's just, I think they have to start facing the reality of supply and demand out here. And, um, and I think that's why more of these big accounts are going non-union. Um, and, um, you know, any, anything, you know, it's just like if you had a business and if you could go out and you could get quality 
without paying X amount of dollars and it's your business, you're going to go do that. So um, I, I think the, I, I mean, I really think, and I think the union's a wonderful thing. I think it's, I think it's really good. I think it's a little expensive to join. And, uh, uh, but that's another, that's a whole nother topic. But I just think that they, they really need to start looking. Um, we've got a whole different paradigm going here. The, the whole, the game has totally changed. And, and I, and I still don't think they're quite realizing that. I, I totally agree with you. I think that your reasoning as to why rates were as high as they were 30 years ago, it makes a lot of sense. And I, I agree that there is, you know, exponentially more people calling themselves voice actors now than there were 30 or 40 years ago. Thankfully, there's also exponentially more work for us. Work, all yes. So, you know, I think that the digital, the digital revolution, you know, both uh, had a detrimental effect on the business by, you know, multiplying the number of people in the business, but because it added so much more work, it's still possible to make a very good living as a voice actor, mm -hmm. because not making it in 30 and 40 and $50,000 chunks now. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So. Fantastic. Um, so tonight we're talking about work that you're going to be doing, planning you're going to be doing for 2019 to move your voiceover business forward. And we're just opening it up uh, broadly as well to any sort of questions or comments with regards to the voiceover business. Graham, this is Carol Monda. I just wanted to say that um, in the last, I don't know, two months maybe, um, there have been two new genres that have uh, come to me. One is uh, an augmented reality recording or series uh, where my voice is sort of this disembodied thing uh, when people physically are, are, are putting on, you know, gear. Um, and the other is uh, a podcast that I've done several podcasts, but this is a like a fictional story based thing, and both of them are terrifying and fascinating and and wonderful. But I just wondered um, if anybody has anything to say about the idea of you know branching out and or uh, the benefits of expanding. Um, and of course, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt said, do something that scares you every day. Uh, but, but really in terms of just practical business, um, do you, do you have, should you have a limit or a boundary of how many, you know, spheres you enter and embrace? Okay. I'm going to show up. Hey, Carol. Yeah. It's an honor to talk to you. You're a legend and I have, uh, Believe it or not, some advice for you. Jeez, um, oh, who are you, Dave G? I, uh, I did some AR stuff a few months ago for a California operation. Oh. And it, it was really a stretch as far as acting. And I'll say this about the producer uh, and director, a uh, young person, not very experienced at it, gave some guidance, but it was, it was very much an acting gig than just a, a real VO gig. It was very much acting. So it really helps you stretch out in the delivery. And my experience was uh, kind of sky's the limit. Uh, and, and it seemed like having to over deliver stuff is really what they wanted for the, for the augmented reality stuff. But it's very much an acting thing. So good yeah. on you. Go, uh, go get afraid of it. But you got the chops. You can handle it. Oh, amen. Oh. Gosh, Dave, thank you so much. And it's it's really true that because of the way it's structured, they have to give, you know, varied uh, possibilities of people's responses, right? So it's 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 like a mini Siri kind of thing where you record several layers of possible answers and or interactive, you know, uh, responses. So so thank you, and I'm so glad you're doing it too because. 
that's my instinct is like, wow, I feel like now I have new wings, you know, but I, I just don't, I didn't know if I should really just start to fly. So thank you. You've inspired me. There's a lot more of that stuff coming down the road. We're just at the beginning of it and you're going to see a lot more of it. Uh, you're just seeing the tip of the iceberg in the travel area. We're seeing more augmented reality in the travel world that's uh, for walking tours and things like that. Oh, or in the past, it was a different read when you're going to Sagrada de Familia in Barcelona, where you're just putting on your ear pods and listening. The augmented reality is, is it's, it's a different animal. Yeah, yeah, it's present and interactive, literally. Yeah, thank you so much. Talking about uh, planning for 2019, new, um, new areas of business you might want to be going into, um, new coaching or new uh, performance training you might be taking on. Carol, I notice you've been very busy recently with your, uh, with your coaching activity. You're doing work at um, um, the, voice shop. the Voice Shop in New York City. How's that been going for you? Well, largely that's because of you, my friend, because, uh, you know, I, actually, okay, there was another, uh, a woman who had been teaching and she couldn't do it anymore. So I was a, a very lucky legacy, you know, inheritor. But uh, the fact that you knew the mm -hmm. owner um, and we had this great lunch together, uh, it, it, it really, I think, cemented you know the, the the process so we just did i just did a, a commercial class there and it's always uh live uh but it you know in studio but there was a person who thought it was a webinar and so he was just on the laptop you know in zoom um and it worked really well and i think it it has set a precedent that they can have mixed media classes um but yeah, so I'm doing that and I'm doing Global Voice Acting Academy and Edge Studio and, and private coaching. And um, it's, it's, it's so interesting. It's such a small community and yet there are different sects, you know, where I, I have found clients, so just colleagues in different, uh, in, the, in the different venues. Hey, Carol, I have a quick question for you. When you're recording this augmented reality, are you looking at a visual as well? Well, they have sent me a visual. Sometimes, you know, you will see it in real time as you're speaking, uh -huh. which I think is ideal. But the, at least I did, yes, I did get to see a, a visual of what it would be like with a scratch track. Got it. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Thanks. Yeah. Are you doing uh, or thinking of? Oh, I, I think it's fascinating. I, I, it sounds really interesting. I, I do, um, I record um, for uh, interactive training for doctors and nurses in healthcare, and I play the roles of different characters, and, and you're reading lines and you're reacting, and it sounds very much kind of like what augmented reality is in a way. So Absolutely. That would be a great transfer for you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, thanks, Carol, so much for that info. Oh, gosh, yeah, thank you. So, Carol, what is it about this stuff that um, that frightens you? You say you, it, it scares you. Well, I think because both of those things, podcasts, fictional podcasts, uh, or at least the one I've been doing, and the augmented, though it's scripted in some ways, there's a real improvisational quality to it. And, you know, I, I, my background is acting, where you, you get to hide in or immerse yourself in someone else's words, and you can trust them. And, you know, they're, they are playwrights or screenwriters who, who really know how to bring humanity and dialogue I into play. Same with books. Um, but in these cases where it's like, oh, there's a little bit of me in there, that's that's what I find kind of like ah, a little seat seat by your pants, pants by your seat, whatever the phrase is. That's the cool part. You get to put part of your own personality into it, and uh, I find that freeing. 
It is. It has been. It's just, it's like that. For, you know, the first time I went to, uh, I think it's called Space Mountain. It's this, it's this blacked out roller coaster in Disney World. And literally, it's like completely dark, except sometimes you see these like, you know, neon planets. Uh, it's, it's terrifying, but it's some completely exhilarating and, and, and expansive. So that, that's how I feel like it's a terrifying, but really freeing ride. You're right. We have time to sneak in maybe one or two more questions. Who's got something for us tonight? How about you, Graham? Any, anything you want to share? Well, um, you missed uh, you missed us earlier, Carol. We were talking about I, I wanted to talk about um, the infamous Diet Coke audition that has been circulating <gasps> around the the uh, uh, non union world, where they're just asking for a whole lot of work for not very much money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I I discussed my 2019 resolution as being to really fully utilize a customer relationship management system, a CRM system, and yeah. keep better track of, you know, they say it's, what, 10 times easier to get work out of an existing client than to land a new one. Yep. And uh, I just don't think I've been doing a very effective job in staying in contact with those people I've done um, work with before. So... Oh, that's a great, that, that's great. I think that's a really, you know, viable, realizable goal. I'm certainly hoping so, that's for sure. Yeah, I was at, a, at an event with uh, Carol, I guess it was a month ago, bemoaning the fact of uh, all these uh, books that I've, I'm backlogged with. And, and she said, get a whiteboard, <laughs> write them all down and, and have some kind of flow chart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, thanks, James. Yeah, yeah. And it was also a little bit like, you know, um, even even with you, Graham, what you're saying is what, what underlying this is uh, has all to do with the fact that you've gotten a lot of work. And so sometimes it, it becomes difficult to remember to be the businessman, you know, the, the, the flowchart manager of your own life. Yeah, it's sometimes you, um, yeah, it's easy to get caught up in the minutia and forget kind of the big picture flowchart, as you say. So, yeah. still have time for to sneak in one more question. All right, I'm the newbie who wants to ask a question. Hey, hey, Joe, speak up just a little bit for us and ask away. Yeah, so I, I'm obviously, like I said, a newbie into this. Welcome. I really appreciate you uh, letting me get on this. This is awesome. I really appreciate it. Um, the question I have is I'm, I'm looking to, I've been doing a lot of practicing to take some classes, worked on getting my studio set up, and now I've gotten to the point where I feel okay on putting my feelers out and trying to get some work. I know they have a lot of those voiceover sites. Um, people also talk about getting some agents. Just wondering what people feel is the best first step. Um, and if it's something like going to a voiceover website and paying for a subscription there, which websites people think are the best. I, I know they've got those ones that people always grumble about like Fiverr, but then you got ones like voices.com and Bidalgo. Does anybody have any experiences and what would they recommend for somebody just getting started out on it? Well, I can tell you my career started on voice123.com. Um, I, when I first got into this business, it was on voice123 that I landed my first few jobs. And it was on voice123 that my agent found me and reached out to me. And, uh, you know, certainly the online casting sites, I'm a big believer in fishing where the fish are. And you know, every day there are literally dozens and dozens of new jobs being posted to voice123.com and, and to voices.com. Voices.com has a very different business model that many people in the voiceover community aren't very happy about, but um, they seem to be getting better. They seem to be 
acting more responsibly, more eth- ethically than they were. Uh, but Dalgo is is run. It's a great platform. It's run by a great guy named Armin Hirschstetter. Um, everybody l- loves him, but he has a fairly limited number of jobs posted. You know, he's he's getting better. He's getting more jobs being posted, but you know where Voices.com or Voice123.com may have you know literally 60, 70 jobs posted in a day for both men and women, um, you know, Armin has a couple or three maybe. So, you know, there's, there's, there's less work at Bidalgo, that's for sure. Uh, the other one that people have been talking about, um, I have yet to play with it very much, and that's the Voice Acting Hub, voiceactinghub.com. And um, a lot of the agents um, the regional agents have been turning to voice casting hub as a potential source for, uh, for both posting work and to, uh, receive work. Awesome. Thank you for that advice. I appreciate it. No problem, Joe. It's a pleasure. And we're just a minute or two after 10 o'clock. So we're going to call it a night. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending tonight and your participation. Um, it's been uh, it's been great having a chance to um, to uh, to play with you all tonight. Um, so until next week, um, work hard, audition lots, and book lots of work. We'll talk to you next Sunday night. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks, Graham. Thanks, Graham.